You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo first looked at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Writers have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, an award-winning filmmaker, self-professed book nerd, and creator of the Paris Underground Radio podcast network. This podcast is for anyone who loves books, loves authors, loves France, or any combination therein. Each week, I'll speak with an author whose life, stories, or characters have a connection to France. Then, these amoureux de livre will treat us to a reading from their book. Who on earth would be brave slash crazy enough to move to Paris, quit their secure job in finance, and open a cooking school? The answer, of course, is Jane Birch, founder of the iconic La Cuisine Paris and author of The French Ingredient. In her beautifully written memoir, Jane details how she transformed from banker to business owner, all while navigating the inevitable cultural differences she faced as an American expat and the countless curveballs life threw her way. It's hard, I think, to write a book about life as an expat that avoids cliché and rings true to other longtime expats. Jane does this expertly. The French ingredient makes you want to pull up to the kitchen counter, cozy up with a warm espresso, and dream big. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce Jane Birch, author of The French Ingredient. Hello, Jane. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm so happy to see you face to face. I feel like we've met before, but I I don't know exactly when or where. I feel like this is, in any case, very long overdue. Exactly. Exactly. So can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay. So my name is Jane Birch. My accent will give me away. I am from (laughs) the U.S., the great city of Chicago, which I'm very proud of. And um, I have lived in Paris since the end of 2005. And I actually came to Paris because I worked in banking. I worked in finance for a number of years, 10 years actually, which I really loved. And that's what brought me to Europe. And that's what brought me to Paris. And then a few years into that, I decided to pick up sticks and do something for myself, something a bit entrepreneurial. So for 15 years, coming up to this October, actually, I have been working at La Cuisine, which is cooking school here in Paris. And I'm I'm the founder of La Cuisine Paris. That's amazing. That's such an incredible story. And my instinct is, of course, to ask you how you went from being a banker to the head of this cooking school. But I'm not going to ask you that because that's what your book is about. (laughs) Just a little bit. And it's a long, (laughs) it's a long and very interesting answer. And I think everyone should just read it for themselves. I won't ask you that. I hope so. Yes. Thank you. Normally, I would ask if you have a connection to Paris or to France, but it's quite obvious that you do. Were you a Francophile growing up? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> Jennifer, and I and I think you probably know this because maybe you know a bit about the book. I was not. I was not. And my first experience with Paris was a difficult one. I did not particularly enjoy it. I was never looking at it with doe eyes um, when I got an opportunity to come here. It was the opportunity I came for, not Paris. And I was very nervous about coming to Paris. So my love affair with Paris has had turmoil, but I think any great love affair does, doesn't it? Yes, and especially a French love affair. It's a little bit more romantic. Oh, God. Yeah, there's always some drama in there. I had the same experience. I came here as as a child and did not like it at all. Paris was never on my radar, and yet here I am. But I feel like, you know, I feel like we're in this small group of things that you can't say. Mm-hmm. Like, like when you say that, well, actually, I didn't like Paris at first. I mean, people are just, they're almost mortified. So one thing I'm still not allowed to say and probably shouldn't even say to you is that I don't like croissant. <laughs> you know what? I don't like Macron. <laughs> there we are. Let's just out wow. each other right now. I know. <laughs> Look at that. 
I didn't realize this was going to be such a scandalous tell all. <laughs> God, yeah, it's just all happening here. So I want to talk to you about the French ingredient. Can you let us know a little bit about what this book is, what it's about? My goodness, yes, the French ingredient. Every time I hear the title, I, I laugh because that was the maybe the hardest part of the book. I, I did not want people to think it was a cookbook. And with me being the founder of a cooking school, that that concerned me. So what is the book about? I thought really carefully in looking at the title because it's not a recipe book for food. I like to think very modestly, it's my recipe book for how I've built a life in Paris. So that's what it's about. It goes through how I got here, how I felt about it, how I made a career change into an industry that I knew nothing about and into an industry that was not my dream. It was a vision that came to me, but it was not this lifelong dream. And I had to learn a lot. And it kind of goes through that journey. I think the way you describe the book is exactly how I would describe it too, only I didn't have those words. It does feel like a recipe book for how to integrate successfully into a life here as an expat. Yes. And I say this, you know, it's always we the beautiful thing about Paris is we each have our own vision of Paris. Yes. You know, and she means so many different things to so many different people. So this is just my little piece of the pie that I'm happy to share with others. So having been a banker and then a head of a cooking school, how did you then become a writer? Was this something that you'd always wanted to do? <laughs> Again, um, <laughs> something that kind of came as a vision. And um, the one thing I have learned is you can love ideas, but sometimes you need to know when to let them go if they're not going to serve you. My first idea was a how to do business in France. And I thought that was really an exciting book. And a few people who were close to me said, okay, well, you know, like two people are going to buy that book. One will be your mother <laughs> and, and the other will be your friend that feels bad for you because nobody else is buying it. But I did slowly get my head around, maybe there's a book about my experience that could be interesting. And I wanted to share that with people. And the book really started to come together, Jennifer, at a crisis point, very much like La Cuisine, by the way. And that crisis point was COVID. I had a lot of time on my hands and I needed something as a project. And you know the days that we dealt with in COVID. So on top of being home and having the anxiety about a business that's in food and tourism with no visibility about, there were times when I thought we'd never open again. Yeah. You just didn't know. And so writing was a salvation for that really dark time. And that's kind of how it evolved. I know you must be very disciplined as a business owner. Were you disciplined as a writer as well? <laughs> Did you have a routine? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and I was so like, you know, so the book also, you know, a lot of the writing started to take place even after COVID. And I had all of these dreams and visions of myself, you know, like sitting in a cafe, wearing wearing my beret, having this like <laughs> ruby red lipstick with like Hemingway's great, great grandson behind me and me just typing out this beautiful prose. That just did not happen. So I, I realized I have to accept myself as I am, <laughs> right, right when I can get an idea, which sometimes would happen once a day. Sometimes it would happen like once a month. So I was not disciplined at all. And so writing actually tamed me rather than me taming it. Very interesting. And I probably know the answer to this already, but the book is a memoir. Did you write it chronologically? I tried to. I tried to. But, you know, in creating a memoir and thinking back, and I tried to go back far enough that people kind of understood how I think, it's hard to do that. You know, I'm in my late 40s. And so I went back to kind of some childhood things to explain, you know, my relationship with my family and how I got to Europe and how I've done some of the things I did. So I did try to write it chronologically. I did try to have a timeline. But there are little parts that kind of are reflective and go back a bit. Did you find that there were some parts that were harder or easier to relive or to recall? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I I wanted the book to be a fun read and I wanted it to be light. And I 
my happiest moment will be if somebody reads that and they say, you know what, if this gal from Chicago who knew nothing about cooking can go and open a school that's still there 15 years ago and doing relatively well, I can do anything. So I wanted that to be the spirit. But in doing that, I had to touch on some really challenging moments because those are the things that shape us. And those were hard to relive, you know, especially in the attempt to address what it's like to be an expat. It's not always easy. You know, I don't take it for granted, but it is difficult when you're far from home and you're far from family and things happen. Absolutely. I was talking about your book with a a friend who also is an expat who's lived here for a very long time. And I was telling her about your writing and your style and how you went through a lot of things that all of us who've been living here for the past 10, 15 years have had to go through. And I said that you write about things very honestly and candidly and transparently, but in a way that is approachable and not re-traumatizing. So I think that's a very delicate balance. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, those are the tough stories that we need to share. Yeah. To let people know that we all have a human existence. We all deal with failure, with insecurity, with death, with breakups with, you know, all sorts of things. And that must be a part of the story. We can't hide those things. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. You talk a little bit about your childhood, a little bit in the book. And I was wondering, you know, when you're talking about the idea of a cooking school, you say it just sort of got in your head and then stayed there. Yes. Was it something that you'd imagined as a child? Was it like the thing you wanted to be when you grew up? Never. Never. If you ask my mother what I wanted to be when I grew up, I've never said this out loud, I don't think. I wanted to be a WWF wrestler. <laughs> I wanted to be an acrobat. So very Okay, similar. so there we are. <laughs> I was, you know, so that was like my dream as a, as a young girl. I was very, very much a tomboy. And so that was my dream. Cooking school, never. Had you have asked me 16 years ago, Maybe we're right at that moment. So let's say uh, 16 years and two months ago, (laughs) if I wanted to have a cooking school in Paris, I would have looked at you like you have four heads. But, you know, sometimes, and maybe I'm getting this way in my old age, (laughs) uh, sometimes when you stop fighting against yourself and the universe, you end up where you're meant to be. That's my answer to it. That's a beautiful answer. And I will say, in having read your book, I do feel like maybe sometimes in the management of the school, maybe you were a WWF wrestler. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. I just got to think of what my stage name would be. I I still can come up with that. Maybe that will be my pseudo for the the next book, if ever there is one. Yeah. Yeah. I think once you have that idea, the next book will just flow. Oh, God. I have no doubt. I think the next book will have to be after La Cuisine has closed one day, then I can share all the fun, crazy, the real crazy (laughs) stories. That makes sense. So does having a cooking school change your relationship to food? It does. So I grew up in a family where food was so important. It was not precious at all. Meat and potatoes family. But it was the vehicle for everything. The kitchen table at my grandmother's was where everything happened. She lived at her kitchen table, now that I think about it. And so I think it's changed my understanding of food just being a vehicle. I don't even want La Cuisine to appear precious. That's not what we're there for. We're there to share. And when you get people together over a subject that we all understand... It changes people. It changes their views of one another. It opens their eyes. You know, so to me, that's what food is for. And that's how I've tried to to build La Cuisine. I get very frustrated sometimes in the food movement where it feels so exclusive and and so us them. And 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 I really don't like that. I think this is what can bring us together. You know, a meal is nothing but a vehicle of the memories of a chef. And and we should use that to share conversation and gather and spend nice moments connecting. That's a beautiful perspective. I really like that idea. And it softens kind of the idea when you go to a French restaurant and the chef refuses to put the sauce on the side or whatever. If you think of that really as you're eating an extension of them and their care and their love, it changes yeah. it. 
Exactly. And, and their vision and their history and perhaps their grandmother's recipe. And, you know, that's what food should evoke in us. Not a, oh my gosh, it's so precious. Do I belong here? Quite the contrary. Does French culture sometimes leave you scratching your head? Well, you might enjoy listening to our sister podcast, Navigating the French, hosted by journalist Emily Monaco. Each episode focuses on a different word in the French language, and Emily is joined by an expert who will help explore what that word says about French culture. Listen now to Navigating the French on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. And have you changed as a cook? Do you cook more often now yourself? So cobbler's children. <laughs> I I love to host for meaningful things. Again, when you're bringing together friends, Thanksgiving is is something that I do spend a lot of time preparing for, and I love to share with others. Do I cook on a daily basis? Very simply, very modestly, nothing fancy. That, I mean, that makes sense. Who has time? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm certainly not like whipping out a book bourguignon every morning. I'll tell you that. So, you know, you're talking before about the book that you were going to write, giving advice to someone opening a business here in France. My first reaction is I don't understand how anyone could write that book because it just seems like everything here is so unwritable, unknowable. It's amorphous and at the whims <laughs> of whoever is in front of you. Yes. So I feel like the whole book would just be like you being thwarted for. 300 pages. <laughs> You're right. And it's um it's funny the the dynamics and the relationships we have in this you know we're like frogs in boiling water. You know stuff just happens to us and sometimes you don't even <laughs> you don't even take notice of it. Like the other day and it's happened twice in the past couple of months at a restaurant whoever I was dining with took exception to either where they were seated or how they were ordering something. And the anxiety we felt about upsetting the waitress was unreal. We had a protracted discussion about, as an example, a friend of mine is not eating gluten at the moment. She wanted to order a burger without a bun. Oh. Yeah. It was a thing. It was a long discussion with the waitress. The waitress called her bizarre. <laughs> the waitress said, I have to talk with the chef. She left. And Claire is just like, just make the burger but they'll put the bun and um no so you know things like that we laugh at but it's like there's no other country in the world where you're going to be worried about how the waitress sees you and then spend the rest of the meal trying to make up and win their affection oh, it's true it's anxiety <laughs> producing i agree totally. with you wholeheartedly and god forbid you get a piece of meat cooked at a temperature that you didn't want it and you have to have the discussion with them about what temperatures mean because no matter what you're going to be wrong and even if they do take it back they're going to be furious they're going you. to be furious and who knows what your food's going to be like after that exactly exactly so those are fun things that we just kind of accept now but yeah yeah <laughs> i fully fully understand en france as they say so would you encourage people who moved here to start businesses? You know, I would encourage anyone to take the opportunity to really look into whatever little idea is pestering them. I would say about France, I jumped fully into this idea once I had it because it harassed me. And I was able to do that because I didn't know enough. And when we wait to have so much information, sometimes that derails us. So for any idea, whoever has, even if it's moving to France, sometimes you just have to get in the pool. If you continue to stand on the outside and take the temperature and check the chlorine, you're never going to get in. You're never going to get in. I think that's true. And I think there's something that I've noticed that you mentioned in your book as well, which is that, well, you mentioned this a lot in your book, is that the French will say no. To everything right in the beginning. Yeah. And there are ways to do things and there are rules with how to do things. And there is a huge benefit to being an American living here because when someone tells you, no, you can't do it this way, our instinct is, well, watch me and let's see what happens. Exactly. And I think you get a lot done that way. You do. And it allows you to push boundaries 
And I'm very open to say my secret sauce for the success of this school, which is still there, knock on wood, is that I knew nothing. So I was able to approach it with ultimate curiosity to study it, to ask questions that people who should know, quote unquote, wouldn't dare. Mm -hmm. Me, my difference to my French comrades was what my benefit was. So, you know, another message for own your differences, they might be your best assets. I agree. I think that's one of the things that I love the most about your book, how you explain, I don't know if that's the right word, but how you investigate the cultural differences between the French and the Americans. And as someone who's lived here myself for nearly 15 years and has read a lot of an American in Paris books, I'm always wary and maybe, (laughs) let's be honest, a little too easily annoyed. Oh, God, I know. By these books that always have, you know, the same tropes, the same stereotypes, and they're very superficial and black and white. And one of the things that I really loved about your book is it seems like you genuinely respect both cultures and you really spent a lot of time lovingly investigating the differences. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm so glad you said that, Jennifer, because I think when uh, I did have a friend that read it and she was like, you're quite hard on Paris. And I'm like, well, Paris was hard on me, damn it. But I think when you know something intimately, you see the blemishes. But isn't it our, I just had my dentist tell me this, it's our blemishes that make us beautiful. It's our little nuances that make us who we are. So I think after a certain point, I have the right to complain about Paris. She's not perfect, but I love her for her imperfections as well. But it's not a book. I don't see you as being hard, maybe because I'm similarly hard on Paris. (laughs) But for me, it, it felt very much like you were understanding the why behind yes. that hardness or the differences or the walls that you're jutting up against. Yes, yes. Or maybe, you know what, like you, we're so close to it. Sometimes maybe it's hard for us to step back. But for my girlfriend who loves Paris, this is a dream to her. And and I love that I have people like that around me because then I look at the city in a fresh way every day. She didn't see what she expected, which is the No, I don't have coffee every day and croissants. And, you know, my life is a little different. So maybe that was, it challenged her perceptions of Paris a bit and what it's like to really live here. Yeah, I think that's what I appreciated. Paris is a wonderful city. There's no questioning it. It's magical. It's beautiful. When the sky is blue and the weather is just so, there is no place in the world I'd rather be. Yes. But it is not an easy place to live in all the time. Right. Right. And it's not a museum. It evolves and it is a city, a very beautiful one. And a capital one, too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. In your book, you give a lot of details about the teachers that you work with and the classes and how they've evolved and a lot of the hardships that you encounter. And I don't want to give any of that away because I think that's the real juice, the meat in the story. Juicy. Yeah, that's the good (laughs) stuff. (laughs) One thing I did wonder is whether you found that French students, whether your French clients had different expectations of a cooking class than American ones might. Very much so. Very much so. And in all honesty, our French clientele are limited at this point and they come at certain times of the year. We tend to see them around the holidays or we will once in a while see them on the weekends. For, because we're doing classic French pastries. So already we have a difference because most of our colleagues that are doing typical uh, classes for the local French market are doing exotics. You know, the average French person doesn't want to know how to make a bernese or, you know, or make a croissant. They re- rely on our experts to do that, which are restaurateurs or boulangers. So they want to learn Thai food or American food, quote unquote, which apparently is a thing. So they do have different interests. It's something that's, you know, for them, maybe we're a bit too grandmother in our approach. And also stylistically, which you know very well, relationship orientation with French people is very different. 
it's not bad, it's not good. And I like to be clear about that because sometimes we have preconceived notions of how relationships are developed. And here it takes time. So that two or three hours that you have with a client that's French, they want to see your technical expertise. They're not there for the environment. So it's a very, very different model. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. If you're enjoying this podcast, you may also enjoy my podcast, City of Muses. Each week, I chat with contemporary artists and creatives to explore what inspires them, where their creativity comes from, and how Paris has helped or hindered their dreams come true. Check out City of Muses now, available wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. Well, I think it would be nice to hear a little bit from the book. Okay. I wanted to share this little passage from the book that I think really explains the beautiful but complex love affair we can have with Paris and how we can have two opposing things happen at the same time. So this is a little passage you'll find towards the end of the book. I once stood gobsmacked on the street watching a group of five-year-olds holding hands with their teachers and walking in a mini protest, yellow vests and all this time protesting about the need to save the planet. I could just imagine the Instagram posts from proud parents announcing Philippe's first manifestation. Each time I see one of these school groups, half of me stands there in dismay. Half of me stands there in complete awe. What a beautiful thing to make sure that from the very youngest age, you don't just sit back. You commit to getting out there and exercising your voice to make change. I've thought a lot recently about the retirement age battle and what it says about me and what it says about the country that's taken me in. Despite what the headlines might suggest, the Parisians I know personally and professionally work incredibly hard, and still they dedicate meaningful time and care to joie de vivre, even if it's just drinking a coffee slowly out of a porcelain cup. And so if it follows that French workers care passionately about having enough retirement time to enjoy the years of leisure they feel they deserve. They will protest for that right. They will rage for that right. They will strike for that right. And while the strikes will always make me crazy, I've begun to understand the importance of holding space, literally and metaphorically, for those conflicting ideas. Thank you so much. So, Do you think that you have another book in you? Oh, God, Jennifer. (laughs) Is it too soon? Sorry. (laughs) Well, you know what? It's not. And you're the second person that asked me that. And the first person that asked me, I said, you know what? Maybe I do. And then afterwards, I said, damn it, I let it out into the universe now. I do fantasize about that idea of writing another book and what it would look like. And trying to take what did I really enjoy about this book? So I, yeah, I kind of have that idea, but we'll see. Let's, let's get this one out into the, <laughs> let's get this one born and then, uh, then we'll see. All right. I won't push, but I would very much like to hear your voice again for what that's worth. Well, thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Well, thank you. So where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with you and what you're doing? And then, of course, where can they find your school? Okay, so super. So I, believe it or not, have just, in the past month, opened up my Instagram account, which is on my name, Jane Birch, because I've always been in the background at La Cuisine, and I did not want to be in the foreground. I think it's important that clients be in the foreground. But I realized with the book that there's a few people that were interested more in what it's like to live in Paris, Um, what are some ideas I have around self-development, because that's been a big part of any of our journeys. You know, we're changing every day. We can't help but change because we're not the same person we were yesterday. We've had different experiences. So I'm sharing a bit of that. So you can find me on Instagram. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'd love to be on LinkedIn. Again, very different voice. I like to talk about other topics than food. But if you want to see La Cuisine, then she has her own presence and is on uh, Instagram account and and is much more interesting than I am what's (laughs) happening at La Cuisine than what I'm doing. But that's just La Cuisine Paris on Instagram and Facebook and all those sorts of things. 
Fabulous. Well, I will include links to all of that so people can find you and your fabulous book and your wonderful cooking school very easily. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I'll look forward to meeting these new folks. (laughs) Thank you so much, Shane. This was really wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Thank you again to Jane Birch for such a lovely conversation. You can find Jane on Instagram and LinkedIn at Jane Birch and La Cuisine Paris on Instagram and on their website, lacuisineparis.com. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with second-time guest Helen Fripp about her novel, The Girl from Provence. Check back next week to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Thank you for listening to Storytime in Paris. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, and you can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to rate and review it wherever you listen to podcasts. This is the fastest and easiest way to help the podcast grow, which will help me attract more great authors to bring to you. Please also spread the word to all the people you know who also love to read. Thank you again, and happy reading! This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.